It's, it's amazing how just a little tiny shift of perspective. It's like you're like looking at something from this position. You just take two steps to the right. It's like, whoa, I didn't see that side mm -hmm. of things. And it just changes everything. And I think that is built yeah. around the premise of what we're talking about. It's just perspective. And those perspective shifts can be the most impactful. And I feel like what, what you're doing is shifting the perspective of something that's been done so routine for so long. And I did have a question. Hopefully, I don't blow this up the wrong way about how I try to ask it. But is it challenging for the doctors? So like you have doctors that are, you know, going through the motions, doing what they're trained to do and taking care of patients. I feel like there is, like when I saw, you know the movie Patch Adams? You ever see Patch yes. Adams with Robin Williams? This might, yes. be a, this might be a terrible comparison, but I feel like he was a doctor that was trying to fulfill, like relate to these patients on a more personal level. And I feel like it was, yeah. from my understanding of that movie, it was, it was kind of like, shamed upon for doctors like no just do your job your clinical you don't have to get personal you don't have to affect the way their their end of life is happening and he saw the other side but i feel like from an institutional side it was like frowned upon to have that relationship i don't know if that compassion is part of your you know your mission but i, I feel like it's part of the, it's a big part of it in regards to having compassion to the way these people are living not just walk in the room and say hey, you have six months to live and then walk out mm. so is that is that a challenging hurdle because i feel like the doctors can't, are doing what they came to do so is that where like another profession steps in and takes over where the doctor just comes in to do what they're trained to do and not get involved with that transition is mm. that i don't know Man, it's it, that's a tricky one to answer because I think that most of us go into medicine because we we love people and we love taking care of people and healing them. Um, and honestly, I think it gets beaten out of us through medical education because the process is so hard, and it you know we're we're all kind of overworked, underslept mm -hmm. and at least during our training and now certainly with the shortage of of medical, you know, staff and what's going on in hospitals now, I mean there's a lot of burnout. Um people are not, you know, connecting with what really drew them to the profession. But to get back to your question, no, I mean of course, you know, compassion and and treating our patients like our family and, and like human beings is so critical. And it's certainly, you know, part of what they're teaching now for medical students is, is how to maintain that sense of, of connection uh, with patients. But it's hard when they say to you, you have 10 minutes to see this patient, get in and out, let's go. And, you know, studies have shown that, that doctors allow their patients to speak without interrupting them for a, a median of 11 seconds, because we're just so, we're in there to get the information and, and you know, come up with a treatment plan and get out. And that is not why any of us went into medicine. That's not what we, you know, want out of the experience. We, we do, for the most part, I mean, I'll speak for myself, I do want to connect with patients. Um, it's just, we're, we're, the system was not designed and optimized for those kinds of encounters and experiences. Mm. Um, now, I think that is changing because physicians and, and nurses are pushing back on that, as well as, of course, patients and families want different experiences. Um, but I do think that's a huge part of it. And, and we know um, from studies. So, you know, uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association did a survey of physicians. I think this was back in 2016 or 2017. And 70, that's seven zero percent of physicians surveyed said that they had never been taught in how to have difficult conversations with patients. So when we're, we're talking about sitting down with somebody and relaying bad news or a difficult prognosis um, or talking about, you know, what are what are your goals uh, of of getting treatment here? Um you know, if only 30% of doctors know how to do that, I think that's a huge failure of the medical system, right? Because if you think about, you know, surgeons, right, spend, I don't know, five, seven years learning how to operate, right? It's a highly technical, you know, set of, of, of skills. And we're spending nearly, you know, very little time at all teaching people the, the highly technical skill of having a conversation, and sitting down with our patients and making eye contact and, and building the kind of rapport that I think is needed in medicine, um, it, we have to do better. And so that's a lot of what we are, are also trying to encourage. 
Yeah, I feel like that goes back to the, you know, all the way to the top. And you said it comes from the education system. But I mean, I forget where I heard it last, but you kind of just reconfirmed it. It, 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 What what I was kind of leading into in the question, and I did realize, and I I feel like you just reaffirmed it, was how doctors are so, I mean, they only have so much time and there's so many people that need help. So it's like they're spreading themselves so thin. It's hard to expect, okay, I'm going to spend more time with this patient, but then you're leaving other people waiting in the other room or waiting in the waiting room. So it's just... I, I, they are they are spread thin, right? So you can only expect so much, and it's the stress that it lays upon you. So if it's like, then you add another layer of trying to connect with people on that level. When you just said what the average amount is eleven seconds, where a patient is speaking uninterrupted. So it's how do you even combat that without having more doctors? Yeah, I think it's really hard. I I think we absolutely have a massive physician and nursing shortage in this country. So that's that's one huge issue. And it's only gotten worse because of the pandemic. So many people have gone to part time or, or quit the profession altogether. And the reason why, I believe, is because we have such a systemically flawed healthcare system. Mm. So as I mentioned, you know, by design, nothing was set up to be optimized for the best outcomes for um, patient satisfaction and and physician satisfaction too, right? It's we're we're, we're focused on you know billing and and doing procedures and getting people in and out of the operating room, and that's that's fine, right? But the, these other pieces of the puzzle, which are making sure that our healthcare staff are are fulfilled and enjoy coming to work every day, and that patients and families feel like they're being well taken care of. I mean, that's, you know, just as important, if not more than, you know, making sure that the business of medicine keeps churning. Yeah. So I, I think that, you know, there are some health systems trying to address this, but it's it's extremely complicated and we're entrenched in, in very old systems. And so, I mean, I, I think it, it has to change. We're, we're in we're literally in a crisis right now. This might be a silly question, but is there anyone is there, is there anyone that exists in a position, like say, where the doctor walks out of the room, where someone else slips in and handles that aspect of, mm. you know, comforting and having more of a discussion, less clinically about what can be done to end well, if you will. Sure. Oh, absolutely. Well, I will first say, you know, that the that the field of of palliative care right. emerged, you know, out of necessity, um, maybe. 10, 15 years ago, um, because the, the, you know, there, there, these critical conversations, you know, weren't taking place often enough and people f- who were seriously ill with a life defining illness a- and near the end of their lives weren't being cared for necessarily, uh, in the best possible way. And so palliative care is a, f- a newer field of medicine that usually consists of, a uh, well, a team based approach to care, which is a, a nurse, a doctor, a social worker, a case manager, sometimes a chaplain and a pharmacist. So thinking about some of those folks are a little more non-clinical, um, to be able to come and, and support, and have those kinds of conversations. But I, you know, I just want to also say that, you know, this is a a critical field um, and one that, you know, nearly every healthcare institution has a palliative care team, but people are often not referred to palliative care. They often have to ask for it if they want it. And this field of medicine Mm -hmm. really focuses on the relief of suffering and focuses on quality of life for anybody facing a, uh, a serious illness and can be used at any time during the course of illness. So it's not just about people who are near the end of their lives or embarking on hospice, which is a type of palliative care. This is for anybody, whether you're receiving treat, you know, curative treatment for cancer, whether you're receiving an, an organ transplant, whatever the case may be, palliative care can be incredibly helpful. And yes, to answer your question, I know I'm being long-winded here, but I think this is important that you know that these are people who are expertly trained in having these conversations and and helping and treating people, treating their their pain, their suffering, their existential distress or psychosocial issues around um, facing illness, and it's very powerful. Thank you.